Okay, good to be at Bible study. Uh, big winter storm on its way at 6 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> oh, me. Uh, for those of you that are not here and you're watching on YouTube, that was kind of an inside joke. So uh, we're glad to have all of you with us tonight. And uh, we're going to get right into it, dig right in. And Eldon, would you pray for us? Amen. Thank you. And um, we're going to go back to Romans tonight, Romans chapter 1. We got down through uh, verse 14 last week. So we'll pick up in 15. Verse 15, Paul writing to the church at Rome. He's at Corinth. If you, I don't know if you picked up on that last week, but he's at Corinth writing to the Roman church. Uh, so he says, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Um, Paul had separated him unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. We read that about him through his epistles. That, um, and, for, um, and had separated him, we talked about it last week, from his religion, from, from sin, um, and brought him alongside the gospel. And he said, As with all of my ability, I'm going to preach you the gospel. And isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Isn't that how we're supposed to serve God, you know? Uh, with everything that's within us, you know, with all of our might, the scriptures teach us, we're to serve God. And uh, this was the Apostle Paul. What a great example he was. Um, verse 16, I love verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Uh, not ashamed, not ashamed. And we could go through a whole list of reasons why a person should not be ashamed of the gospel. Should not be ashamed of the gospel. You know, you could think about the, the cost of it, the price of it, you know. To us it's free, but it cost the Savior his life, didn't it? The only one just, the only one holy, the only one innocent, the only one perfect. Uh, he came, came and gave himself willingly, his life willingly, so that we could be saved and and it, it, you could just go on and on and on why we should not be ashamed. And Paul wasn't ashamed. Now, some scholars say that what he was saying here, too, was he had been, no doubt, been criticized. He, he had longed to go to Rome, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't t let him go. It would take him somewhere else. We talked about all that. Um, and some were saying, well, you know, uh, maybe the gospel, maybe he's not coming because the gospel... Uh, it, will not prove itself here that Rome is such a power and so much evil is going on in Rome and but there had already been a church established there there were Christians there that he was writing to and 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 so some say he was saying I'm not ashamed of it you know it, it's the gospel it it holds all power God does and his gospel does and and so it's like if you believe something Let's, let's say we believe something, but we were ashamed of it because we really, we, we really didn't know for sure what we had believed. We're ashamed of it because 
maybe we'll be ridiculed because of what we teach. Um, Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He was willing to give his life, ready to give his life. And he did give his life for the gospel's sake. We can do the same. We can do the same. We don't never need to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's the good news, isn't it? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, but it goes much deeper than that, as we'll find out in this chapter. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's another reason he wasn't ashamed. It's the only way to salvation, isn't it? This means yes. It's the only way to salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation. It's how God saves us. It's through the gospel, through the through the preaching of the word. And, and I, I love uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul starts that out, you know. And I think I'll just turn there and read it to you real quick. It, it's the gospel in a nutshell. Um, 1 Corinthians 15. He said, moreover, brethren, this is verse 1. I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Isn't that wonderful? Not only was it preached to them, they received it, and now their faith is anchored in it. By which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain. <coughs> uh, now here it is. <coughs> Excuse me. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sin according to the scriptures. Sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel, isn't it? In a nutshell. That's, that's it. Christ died for our sin. The birth is not mentioned. Uh, but it's his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And faith in that is what brings, is the power to bring salvation to a lost and dying world. And then he confirms this gospel as he goes on there in 1 Corinthians by those that witnessed him after he resurrected. And so he said, I'm not ashamed. It's the power of God unto salvation to them, uh, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews first. He came into his own, his own received him not, but as many that did receive him gave he power to become the sons of God. How did he do that? Through the gospel, there it is. Gave he them power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed upon his name. That's the Jew first. And then he, Paul became the ambassador and, the, and the, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles came in second, the, the Gentile church. Any questions on verse 16? Cursed. Yeah, it's a curse. Mm -hmm. and, and see, that's why the Hebrew, boy, they had such a hard time with it. And if you just think, you can understand that. You know, we can criticize the Jews for not receiving this gospel. But my goodness, the, 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 in their law, the cross was a curse. Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree, you know, and... Uh, um, so the Jews didn't put people on the tree. And if they did, they got them off before 6 o'clock because if they stayed overnight, the, the land would be cursed. And if the land was cursed, they'd die because that was their means of, um, of income. You know, was, They were primarily farmers and herdsmen and, and God cursed the land and they would die. Um, so he's asking them to believe a curse in order to be... To be accepted and to be saved and um, but in actuality it was Christ bearing our curse on the cross on the tree um, the gospel it's not just that he died it's how that he died isn't it you know it was our curse placed on the tree and when we believe on him that died on the tree then our curse is lifted uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave. You know, and there it is. Uh, it, it, it's, you can't make this up, can you? 
You know, if, if man would have made it up, and let's say, you know, he, he told the same story in a different way. He would have took the Son of God and had him riding in on a white stallion, uh, a conqueror, uh, with the sword and the angels following him with his, and, and defeated Satan, you know, in an all-out war. But no, he died this despicable death on a tree so that everybody stands on, the, on a level plane before the cross. Doesn't matter how mighty you are in this world, how educated, how much money you got. And it doesn't matter. Everybody is the same when you come before Calvary because he declared all of us sinners and all of us dead so that in Calvary we could be made, all of us be made alive. Um, a preacher that preaches the gospel is a dead man preaching to dead people. You know, because of sin. But thank God the gospel has brought us to life. Now, we're going to die. It's, it's, that's a promise. It's appointed unto man wants to die. But thank God, thank God our souls have been made alive and the curse upon our souls has been lifted because of the gospel. And that's the power of God unto salvation. <clears throat> Verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's righteousness is a gift unto us, isn't it? Because of what Christ did. Um, we're not righteous. His righteousness is placed in us through faith. Is that right? You know, the Bible says by Ab um, that... Um, that righteousness was imputed unto him, Abraham, because of his faith. Abraham didn't do anything to deserve it, even back under the law. It was through faith then. And uh, God put his righteousness in Abraham because he believed God. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, is the verse I was thinking of. So here we believe God. We believe the gospel is what Paul is saying here which is the power of God unto salvation, and God's righteousness is placed in us, given unto us through faith. Any thoughts? And the just shall live by faith. Verse 18. Now look, here we are. He starts this great epistle out. Um, uh, it's the epistle of salvation. When you read Romans, you're reading about salvation. I mean, he takes you through it. He takes you back through it. He, he explains it to us. And uh, we're all condemned because of sin, but because of God's righteousness, we can be made righteous. And Romans lays it all out. But <clears throat> So he said, now, I'm ready to preach you the gospel. I'm ready to preach you the gospel. And we done, we've already declared by Scripture that the gospel is the story of Jesus, isn't it? The, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But look what he does. He starts talking about sin, don't he? First thing he does after he declares he's going to preach them the gospel is he finishes the entire, this entire chapter, uh, 18 through 32 verses, Talking about ungodliness, unrighteousness, and sin. Here's the point. You can't preach the good news of Jesus without first preaching the bad news of sin. Because people who are to be saved must understand that they are sinners before they can receive the righteousness of God by faith. And for everybody that thinks you... You, you know, the only, that God wants us to just always be positive. Paul has never been more positive of, of anything than that sin, unrighteousness, ungodliness will be judged by God and condemned. And he is. Verse 18, for the wrath of God 
the judgment of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in, un, in unrighteousness. So, he, sent, he gave us the gospel. He gave us the way of salvation because ungodliness is going to be judged. And without a way out, without a plan, without a remedy, then all would die, wouldn't they? We would have all died. We would have all died. Even under them that are under the law, Kevin, because the law could not justify you. Couldn't do it. It took a sacrifice that was holy and acceptable unto God, and that sacrifice was Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God's going to judge sin. America may not see it that way. Much of religion today may not see it that way. Prosperity preachers may not teach it as I hear them about every week, every day, if not every week. Uh, but it's going to happen. And it's as if it has already happened uh, because God said it would happen. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them. Um, Let me read verse 20 and then we'll go back. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, <clears throat> let's go all the way back before the flood. Uh, Adam and Eve knew about God, didn't they? They knew God. They had walked with him and talked with him, and then they fell and become separated from God. And we were all in the loins of Adam at the fall, and so it's all handed down to us through the generations. Sin was the, the, uh, uh, the sin of Adam. By one man's transgression, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and we'll all die because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible teaches. And so, but, but, the knowledge of God was handed down also. I mean, you know, I, I think I preached here other Sunday morning. Uh, Cain and Abel had a knowledge of God, didn't they? They did. Now, one worshipped rightly and offered a, a sacrifice that was acceptable unto God, and the other one didn't. And so right there you start, you see people start moving away from God in the, in the form of Cain, Cain. And then generation after generation, they continued, even though they had a knowledge of God, because that which may be known of them is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. That's verse 19. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him <clears throat> from the creation of the world, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead, so that they were, are without excuse. And then he says, not only what, did I give, did they have a knowledge of God at the very beginning? At the very beginning, they had a knowledge of God. And it was, it survived the flood. It survived the flood uh, in the person of, uh, of Noah and then definitely Shem. Uh, but even then, <clears throat> as, as people moved away from God, uh, began to uh, glorify mankind instead of glorifying God he says they're still without excuse they're without excuse because God is revealed in creation that's what Einstein said Einstein was a, was a, a, a Jew and wasn't a believer but he wrote that there has to be a designer he didn't believe in evolution there has to be a designer because the universe is too perfectly put together I mean, it's too much in harmony, you know. The, the earth is just the perfect distance from the sun so that it can sustain human life. If it was, I forget how close, if we move just millimeters closer to the sun, you might say, then we'd all burn up. It's all too perfectly, you know, if evolution, if there was no God and it just happened... How did life sustain itself before it got to where it could sustain life? That may not make sense, but, you know, uh, it didn't happen. 
It didn't happen. Evolution didn't happen. There's a designer, and he is God. And so God says in here in verse 20, a man should be able to just look at creation and say, I know there's a God, right? I know there's a God. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Now, how did they know him? God gave them the knowledge of himself back in the days of Adam and Eve. And it was to be handed down uh, through the generations. Um, And then they knew God because of creation. The creation story, which was also handed down. And just taking a look at their surroundings, God's creation. So because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts, heart was darkened. And that's what happened. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. That's what happens. Uh, man moves away from God, he moves closer to himself. Trusting himself, worshiping himself, um, then what we call humanism takes over. And that's man's ability to, um, to sustain himself. The trust of one, the trust of mankind in mankind. And uh, when you move away from God, the more you learn, the f- more foolish you get. You cannot be successful without God. I don't care who you are. You cannot be. And that's where we're at today. In America, a nation that was built upon the Judeo principles of God is right there. We have become fools. We become foolish. And we'll accept anything. We'll accept almost anything. And I want to tell you a prime example is this COVID virus. I mean, how foolish are we? We have been told a million different things to do and ways to do it, and none of them work. And we, can, we just buy right into it the next time. You know. Well, not, masks don't work. No use wearing masks. This is what the head man said at the beginning. Then he said, oh, wait a minute. We, yeah, I, we've got to wear a mask. And then it wasn't one mask, it was two masks. And I ain't making this stuff up. And this is the most... The highest paid individual in the government today. And the smartest. And I'm not saying he is brilliant. But we become fools because we leave God out of the equation. In every area. In every area. And and I'm not just throwing off on Dr. Fauci. I'm just using that as an example. You know. And then we're told, the vaccine, get the vaccine, you can't spread it, you won't get it. I got the vaccine. I got it, and I'm, I've probably spread it. You know, who knows? So what do you believe? What do you believe? And I want to believe these guys. I trust my doctor. I wouldn't go if I didn't trust her. But this is where we're at. This is where we're at. We have separated. We have have dethroned God and enthroned human reasoning and intellect. And that's where we're at. And what happens? We become vain in our imaginations and our foolish hearts are darkened. Because you see what... uh, When we take our faith out of God and put it in man, then it it, it just, it multiplies itself. It becomes, it it starts out small, you might say. Um, You know, um, instead of evolution, they taught in our universities theistic evolution. That, you know, evolution is real, but it was God that started it. See, that's a lie within itself. Either God created the heavens and the earth 
or the rest of the Bible is a lie. Right? If you can't believe that, you can't, you can't dumb it down. You can't water it down and say, well, no, God did it, but he just started the, pro- he started the process. No. Either God said it, it happened, or the, all of the other Bible is fallacy. Every bit of it is fallacy. And so we start down that road, you know, and, uh, and we become fools. Uh, verse 23, and change the glory of God and change the glory of, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man into birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. And this is what happened through the, <clears throat> through the generations. They began to worship idols. Um, And, and then, and today in America, we worship ourselves. We worship ourselves. Absolutely. It's the law, Sammy. It's the law. There's a law against killing eagles. But it's, it's also a law that you can, there's no law against killing babies. This is where we're at. And see what happens is, I'll get to it in a minute. Um, Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And this is what happens. You know, when there's no God, no judgment, um, no standard to live by, no godly standard, no righteous standard to live by, then anything goes. And when God starts withdrawing himself because of ungodliness, because of ungodliness, then impurities. And if you look at all the societies that have withdrawn themselves from God, sexual impurities come to the top. That's where Rome was. You know, Rome was so ungodly um, at the time that Paul wrote this letter. I, you know, you, you, you almost wonder how they even got a church started in the place, such as at Corinth there where he's at. Uh, <clears throat> so he gave them over to these lusts to dishonor their own hearts, uh, through the lust of their heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, <laughs> who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Um, We worship, you know, I, uh, you know, you read the history of Rome and how that in the theaters where that a horse was more valuable than a human life. And uh, you had those events and the gladiators and the, and they slew and killed one another for sport, and uh, the slaves killed one another. Uh, and it was just all a big game, and human life meant nothing. Uh, today we don't do that, but you know our sporting events and the uh, arenas have almost become like the the arenas when the gladiators are there. I, you know I. Of course, I, I like basketball. And, and I, I watched, I, I sat the other night and watched the fans, you know. And, and in, at the football games that's being played, and they just beat on each other and beat the walls and scream and holler and the roar. Uh, got a message from a friend, Carolyn did, from Kansas City, and said she lived there in the town. and. If you've ever went up through Kansas City going north toward uh, where I hunt up in Iowa, you go right past the, the, where the Royals play baseball and Kansas City Chiefs play football, two big arenas right there on the side. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and she said that she could hear, you know, from her house, it was like th- just a roar of the fans. And they tell me you go to the Titans game and you get out of your car down there at Nashville and you can just hear the roar 
of the fans, you know, cheering for. And I, that's all fun and games. I understand that. But, you know, sports has become a religion in our nation. It's like a religion to a lot of people. Um, who are we serving? Who do we love? What are, who are we worshiping today? And do we even have time to take thought of God in our lives because of everything else that has manifested itself to us? It's the truth, ain't it? Wow. Verse 26. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. Gave them up. Gave them over. You're going to do it. You've done it. Go ahead and do it. And he withdraws himself. I wonder... If that's not what's happening to America today. How did we get to where we are so... Not just how did we get to where we are. How did we get here so rapidly? Hmm? You know, it's uh, with what Paul is getting ready to address here. In this for, the fornication that uh, he talks about here. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, if, you know, they, they called it when you professed yourself to be gay coming out of the closet you know uh, there's been gay people since the book of Genesis you know um, but they, it was shameful it wasn't accepted it was inordinate affection no one believed that you were born that way it was ungodliness it was a choice and so therefore it didn't happen. But if somebody did, it was like, you know, you hear guys whipping them back into the closet. Now I'm not suggesting that's what you ought to do. But it still ought to be shameful. It still should not be accepted. So it happened. And here we are with it. In this, let's just take this country. Here we are. And we have accepted it. And we have some of the most powerful offices in the land that uh, uh, we have people that hold these offices that are gay, homosexual. Um, and that's not good enough. It's not good enough. Now it's transgender. And surgery to change a person from a male to a female and a female to a male. And I like what Franklin Graham said that only God can change the heart. You know. Uh, that all the surgeries in the world won't change your gender. But God can change your heart. Uh, and then that wasn't good enough. You know, it's like you've heard it. You could take um, a perfectly healthy person and they go to the doctor and they say, I want you to remove my arm. I don't want this. I don't like my arm. I want it gone. And they would pat the individual on the back and, and order a psychiatrist for them because you'd have to be crazy. But you can take the same person and say, I don't like how God made me, so I want to change my gender, and they'll put him on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, this didn't just happen. This is spiritual wickedness and darkness, and it's exactly what Paul is talking about here. And God just said, you want it? Be careful what you want. I'll give it to you. And he withdraws his hand. And our foolish hearts have become darkened. 
And he said, in like, uh, verse 26, and, for this, and, and then that's not good enough, that transgender. But now look what they're doing. Little babies. They're giving them gender-blocking drugs so that they'll grow up not knowing if they're male or female. And then they can choose. And in the public school system, they're being sued. The public educational system in some parts of the country are being sued for pushing this on kids without the parents' consent. Even knowing about it. This is where we're at, guys. Uh, and that for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Now look at this. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. I mean, he spoke about the women first. Even. It's like, I can't believe the women would do this. Because I want to tell you, God made women different than he made men. You know, there used to, it used to be a, a time in my life as a young person that women were different. You expect old knucklehead boys to do stupid stuff and say stupid stuff and act stupid, but women were different. You didn't, I can't remember as a child hearing any woman or girl say bad words, talk about things that they shouldn't talk. Did they? I don't know. Maybe they did. But they sure do now. And there's no difference. Uh, if guys slip around before wedlock, it was a badge of honor. But it wasn't to a girl. It was shameful. It was shameful. But he says here, once God is left out of the equation, when he is dethroned, that even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. They started going after one another. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in his lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemingly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their era which is meat. You know, I remember the first time I preached on Romans 1. I, I was just silly enough as a young preacher to preach it, you know. Well, did nobody preach it? No one in the General Baptist that I knew of. I went to a church, got up, preached Romans 1. And this was a pretty lively church. You could hear a pin drop. I'm glad there's no tapes because I don't exactly know how I preached it way back then. But <clears throat> they got the message. And uh, I remember the pastor sitting on the platform shaking his head in unbelief that I would preach such a thing. Well, maybe number one, because you didn't hear of homosexuality. Uh, it wasn't out in the open. They may, California, you heard something about it, you know. I, I remember a time when someone said, maybe a preacher said, he looked for God to just break the state of California off and cast it into the sea because of the homosexuality out there. It's where it first cropped up, you know. Now he'd have to destroy all of the United States of America, wouldn't he, if that was the case. And so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't accepted back then as I preached it 40-something years ago. Uh, and now it's on every hand. You can't even watch a commercial on television. It makes me want to vomit before I can even get the channel changed. I can't understand it. It's against nature. It's against nat nature's God, as the founding fathers called him. Uh, the law of nature and the law of nature's God, they would, they would use the phrases. Men with men, for whatever reason, I got that underlined here in red. Men with men, working that which is unseemingly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, judgment. Judgment, the righteous judgment of God. Um, 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate minds. There it is again. Three times in this chapter it says God gave them over. God gave them over. Has God given America over? Do you think? I do too. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. The only fiber that's holding this thing together is the church of the living God. How much longer can it go on? And I know, I've said it, and you have thought it. Well, it was bad in Moses' day. It was bad in Paul's day. But I want to tell you, the earth has never seen anything like what it is today on a, the mass scale that it's, that it's on. And it's not getting better. And we can cry and bellyache about our politics and <clears throat> I'm this and, and I'm going to do this and I'm going to vote this way. None of that, none of that is going to solve the problem. The only thing that will solve the problem is when the Prince of Peace comes in the clouds and takes us all home to be with him in glory. It, we've, we've reached the point of no return. We really have. Um, think about your politician. Think about him. If he is against what Paul is preaching against here publicly, he or she will never be elected. They will... They will lambast him or her. They will lambast them until they have to pull out of the race. Uh, and it's getting pretty much that way with abortion. They didn't retain God in their knowledge. What does that mean? Can anybody help me? They left God out of their educational system, didn't they? They had no knowledge of God. What, six decades ago, we did the same, didn't we? Didn't we? Uh, as a nation. Now, I know there's teachers that still, in their own way, get the points across. And I'm, no, I'm sure Hannah is one sitting back there. But legally and constitutionally, according to the Supreme Court justices and the law of the land, you can't teach God in school. You can teach evolution. You can teach no God, but you can't teach God. Separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. They said it so much that they began to believe it. Begin to believe it. And it all came about. Um, the Danbury Baptists got word that, uh, that um, Jefferson was going to make um, a particular... I believe it was the uh, Church of the Brotherhood, I'm not sure, uh, the Church of the State. The Danbury Baptist wrote a letter to Jefferson and, and, and challenged him on it. And he wrote him back and, and he said that uh, there is a wall of separation between the church and state. And he assured them that that would never happen. That's the reason America was founded. And they came here from, from Europe, from England, from Britain, you know, is to get away from Catholicism and the the church of the state, which was Catholicism. And, uh, and, and for up until 1948, was it, 49, they used that letter to declare that there was a wall of separation between the church and the state. Uh, the state could not dictate to the churches um, uh, the worship or the practice, their practice. Didn't mean that the church could not be a part of the state. I mean, you can just look at the founding documents and God is in all of them. And so the founders didn't mean that the church couldn't be a part of the state, but the state could not be a part of the church, could not prevail over the church. And uh, until uh, 1948, I believe it was, um, was the first time that they used the letter in reverse, and then in the late 50s was when they uh, voted God uh, basically out of, uh, out of the educational system. In 1961, what was it, Stone versus Graham, uh, they took the Bible out. In 62, it was uh, Shimming, uh, uh, Shimp versus whoever. I can't, I can't think of all of them now. I used to be able to remember those those challenges and those court decisions. But in 62, they took prayer out of school. In 83, they took the Ten Commandments off the wall. 
And, uh, but it was in the early 60s is when they said no more prayer, no more. First time I can remember public prayer was in, in the grade school. Uh, we had teachers that would pray with you and teachers that would start devotion and Bible reading. And, and if you needed prayer, you know, they were saved enough, they'd pray with you. Uh, I was introduced to God through the public school system. And now, look where, look where we're at. It's sad. It's really sad. So, we left God out of our knowledge. We, we didn't teach our kids um, as Israel was taught. Teach them when they rise up in the morning and when they lay down at night. You know. Uh, it's the only way. As, as, as a man thinketh, so shall he be. You know. Now, I know that there's denominations that says, well, if you think it hard enough and name it and claim it, it's going to happen. That ain't what he was talking about. We're supposed to train the minds of our children to think on the things of God. If you train them up thinking and form their minds for God, then when they are old, they won't depart from it. It'll be engraved in them. And... Uh, but we've left God out. We've left God out. And it started 60 years ago in America, primarily right here in our public educational system. And you know what? There was one man, um, Dewey. Dewey was his name. And he was the, he's the arch, one of the architects of modern education. He was a socialist. And his goal was to stamp out any semblance of God in the public educational system. And he's pretty much got his way. <clears throat> Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Now God gave them all. Reprobate minds. Didn't retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over. Does everybody know what the word reprobate means? Void of judgment. Gave them over to minds void of judgment. Look at America. You don't, you don't know what to believe anymore, do you? And nobody else does. And who is able to make the right judgment about anything anymore? Because everything is uh, subjective as I preach Sunday. Even truth is subjective, you know. There's no absolute right. I remember I was, just got to Belmont. And they started sex education in the public school system. And they put it in the paper. One little couple of little lines over in the back of the paper that they were going to have a meeting on at the board of educa at the at the school board meeting. So me and one other parent showed up. Me and one other parent. And I'll never forget they started talking about how they were going to teach the kids about sex in the public school. Sex in the public school. Now they really they really are qualified to teach it, right? So here they uh uh, I forget how, what my question was or my line of thought, but I remember they said, Brother Emery, we cannot teach absolutes. We can't do it. Um, so if you can't teach absolutes, how do you teach anything? How do you teach math if there's no absolutes in math? If 2 plus 2 is... And they tried to change that with modern math. Fuzzy math, I think Bush called it, wasn't it? Uh, 2 plus 2 is no longer 4. But if 2 plus 2 is not 4, then what is it? It, it, it really don't make sense. And I'll never forget that lady teacher. She said, we, or board member, we cannot teach absolutes. And I thought right then, buddy, we are in trouble. We're in trouble. Um, and that's where preachers get in trouble, standing on the truth, absolute truth of God's word. You know, uh, it's okay to dabble around the edges, Kevin, but don't call sin out as sin. Don't specify sin, absolute sin. Drunkenness is an absolute sin. Fornication is an absolute sin. 
Well, no, no, no. You may not understand the feelings of this person that's caught up in it. They may have been raised in a home where they were abused as a child. And so therefore, they, can, they will be overlooked. Not so. Not so. God gave them over to man's full, void of judgment to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Now look, does this not sound like America? Being filled with all unrighteousness. I mean, you can commit murder today in America and be on the street for a thousand bucks in a few hours to kill somebody else. Have you ever seen anything like the lawlessness that we're in? Why did it get this way? Because we no longer believe God. We, there is no spiritual authority in our nation. And therefore, moral authority is gone. All unright, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. I want you to get all these now. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. That's breaking the what? Fifth commandment, isn't it? Uh, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now here's the verse I wanted to get to, this last verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Can everybody say amen? They're not worthy because I, I would think, that I would overlook a lot of these. But I'm not righteous. God's a righteous God. And therefore, he must judge in righteousness. So, those that do these things are worthy of death. Didn't leave loopholes. <clears throat> it's not saying that a dream team can get you off. But look at what it says. Not only to do the same, but to have pleasure in them that do them. Support this mess. Support this mess. Uh, and you can figure out in your own mind what he means by taking pleasure in it. Getting pleasure out of it. Um, and like I said, supporting it at any level. Now he wrote, he began this. Not ashamed of the I'm going to preach you the gospel. Brother Gary got up here and said, I'm going to preach you the gospel. You'd be expecting me to preach a really hallelujah uh, shouting message on the cross. And then, buddy, when I got to the resurrection, everybody be shouting like the songs we sing. I, I love that. Hannah, I love that. When we get to a song and it's talking about the God and it gets to the resurrection, everybody gets happy, you know, because we're going to be a part of that. But if Brother Gary got up here and said, I'm going to preach you the gospel, and I preached... Romans 1 and all the ungodliness that's going to be judged. and You couldn't find somebody that would testify with a search warrant. The high sheriff couldn't, you know. Uh, but it's still the gospel, ain't it? It's the truth. It's, it's why, we, that's why we have received the gospel. is because we were all sown in sin and we're all guilty before God. We're all guilty before God. Except for the grace of God and the, His righteousness imputed in us. And Paul said, not I, but Christ which lives within me. You know, in my flesh there's no good thing. In your flesh. You know, they say, oh, she's got such a good heart. He's got such a good heart. I say it. I see that in people. Or I think I do. But the Bible says that man's heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Without the righteousness of God in an individual, we're all desperately wicked, aren't we? I don't care. We all are. And if we don't guard ourselves, am I the only one that has to guard himself against this world and against sin and the lust thereof? And you can look at me like you're holier than I than thou. But we're all made of the same stuff. And the devil tempts us in the same way. 
But those of us who are saved are overcomers because we keep our faith in Jesus Christ. And the just shall live by faith. Right? Any questions? Anything? Man, I went a long time. Uh, Anything at all. Okay, you can turn her off now.